Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 8th, 2008. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. With this week, home brewer Don Osborne from St. Paul, Minnesota, combines brewing and lawn care. He'll walk us through his experience in making dandelion wine. Tired of looking at those weedy yellow flowers? Put them in the brew pot. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you're on Twitter, you can follow me. My username is Basic Brewing. That's all one word. Here's a bit of a program note. Uh, I'll be taking at least part of the month of June off from uh, posting the weekly audio podcast. Now, keep in mind, I won't be slacking off during that whole time. Steve Wilkes and I will be going to the National Homebrewers Conference in Cincinnati in June, and we'll be working our tails off to get you good content while we're there. So um, I took a break last year in June, and it worked out well to uh, facilitate family vacations and the National Homebrewing Conference, my birthday, etc. So I uh, just wanted to give you a bit of a, a warning, a bit of a heads up there, so you won't be in shock in the withdrawal. Also, for those of you who don't listen uh, all the way to the end of the program each week, Amazon.com is now apparently shipping their Kindle electronic book thingies. And so if you're planning on getting one, uh, click on the special link on basicbrewing.com that's located in the sidebar under our normal Amazon.com link, and we'll get a healthy commission from that purchase. So not saying that you should get one if you don't want one, but if if you're going to buy one anyway... Why not help us out? And I, I appreciate that, and everybody who clicks on the Amazon link and supports us. Uh, I want to take a minute to thank everybody also who wrote in uh, asking about our well-being after reading about the deadly storms in Arkansas this past week. Luckily, we're all safe here. We didn't get the worst of it, thank goodness, and I greatly appreciate your writing in to check on us. Uh, by the way, I uh, Twittered that morning that uh, not only were we okay, but the new hop trellis came through the storm quite upright. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it held my ladder when I had strung the new strings on it for the new hops. So, uh, you know, at least my engineering in that, in that sense is not flawed. Um, let's jump into the mailbag. Uh, last week, I was talking about this past weekend's Big Brew Day being promoted by the American Homebrewers Association, and I, I mentioned the recipe for Chiswick Bitter. Well, Peter from Oxford in the U.K. wrote, Not clear if you were talking about an American or British beer called Chiswick in connection with Michael Jackson, but if it was an English one, it would always be pronounced Chiswick, the W being quite silent. So there you go. I appreciate that, uh, Peter. Uh, so right after I read that, I, I went and ate a sandwich. So <laughs> just, just just teasing, Peter. I appreciate that. Appreciate the note. Not used to mispronouncing English words. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Uh, speaking of things English, uh, Drew from Seattle wrote with some advice for my apparently dwarf East Kent Golding hops. Uh, Drew says, I say you should invest in some shade cloth and water them a lot more than you are. Shade cloth should be easy to come by, and you could probably rig some to hang above your EKGs. Also, to compensate for the higher heat in your area, some extra water, or a lot of extra water, will help the EKGs compensate for drying out so quickly. I I appreciate that, Drew. I'd normally say that's good advice. However, it hasn't gotten hot here yet. In fact, the nights have been quite cool, and we've been getting a bunch of rain. Uh, We're expecting some today and tomorrow, so... Plus, I'm watering each of the hops by hand pretty much every morning, unless rain is predicted. So, it's not that the EKG hops are unhealthy looking. In fact, if they were strawberries, I'd be right pleased. They're green. There are lots of leaves. They're just short. I guess I'm just going to have to wait and see. Uh, Dale from Hillsborough, North Carolina, wrote in, saying, This is my first year growing hops, and I planted an EKG rhizome as well. Funny thing was that it was the first to come up. However, once it reached a certain point, about four or five inches, it stopped. It kept going well as the leaves got bigger and much, much greener, but no height. Then about three weeks later, it just started growing upwards again. Interestingly enough, the one that grows in the shade, a sunbeam, is the one that is really growing tall. 
Like so many things in brewing, patience may be the best prescription here. That's probably probably the best advice there, Dale. Dale also had advice for Tim from Richmond, Virginia, who was wondering if the cat box in his brewing space, the litter box in his brewing space, was causing infected batches. And Dale says, building a box around the cat toilet most likely won't help that much. The cat will still carry a litter out of the pan and in and enclosure on his paws and fur, so the nasties will still be in the air, not to mention the cat's natural affinity to climb on everything. Dale says, I agree he should replace or do a thorough sterilization slash sanitization of all his gear. He should also be careful not to breathe on or to or into his wort or yeast starters. And lastly, a recent addition I've made to my brew day box is a pump dispensing bottle of instant hand sanitizer. Anytime I get near to or touch anything that comes in contact with the wort or the yeast, I first apply a liberal dose of that sanitizer to my hands. So I appreciate that, Dale. Also good advice. Um, what I do as a general practice when I'm brewing is I always keep a, a sink full of iodophor solution handy to dip my hands in often. Or, um, you know, if you forget something to uh, sanitize when you're brewing, you just toss it in there for a couple minutes and it's okay. Chris from Denver heard me talking about the threat of Japanese beetles and he wrote this, thought that I might address the insect issue with an experience from last year. Ladybugs are key. I noticed a ton of small greenish aphids on my hop plant as well as a few hairless caterpillars that were eating the leaves. A few days later, the plant was well populated with ladybugs that were eating the pest insects. This lasted for about a week, and then the plant was clean and grew well. Thanks, Chris. I agree that ladybugs can help with a lot of garden pests, but uh, a ladybug going up against a Japanese beetle would be kind of like a VW bug going up against an M1 Abrams tank. So (laughs) I sent Chris a link to a description uh, and photo of a Japanese beetle, and he wrote back essentially saying, Oh, never mind. (laughs) Those things are big. That's all I'm saying. I appreciate the concern, Chris. Uh, Our buddy Ash from Fayetteville, who you've uh, heard on this program a couple of times, wrote in with this. I was listening to your 417 podcast, and in the letter bag, someone mentioned using the aluminum bottles for homebrew. I use PET bottles with custom caps that allow me to pressurize them, kind of a homemade carbonator. You drill out the cap and put in a universal valve stem, about $2 at the parts store, Then you can charge up the pet bottle or quick carbonate a beer as you're racking to the keg. Ash says, I like it because a good ale can look a lot like iced tea, and I can drink it in the park while watching some of the live bands at Gully Park on Thursday night. Gully Park is a uh, park in Fayetteville, Arkansas. I've also done this in smaller bottles, Green Perrier, so as not to be clear, and taken a case on the river when I go fly fishing in the tailwaters below the dam. A nice ale on the bank of a river with a simple plowman's lunch is hard to beat. You're making me thirsty, Ash, and hungry. Thanks for the note. I appreciate hearing from you. Glad you're still out there. And uh, finally, Justin from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania writes, I've been brewing with a friend of mine for the past five months. He's been brewing for some time now. Recently, We've started using Listerine mouthwash before we create the siphon of transferring the beer from carboy to carboy or kettle to carboy. Our purpose of doing this is to help prevent infection in the beer by cleaning out our mouths with the mouthwash first. Is this a good practice? Are there other ways that could improve the prevention of infection to the beer? We were thinking about getting a siphoning system, but if the mouthwash or some other suggestion works just as well, why put the money into a siphoning system? Well, Justin, I I have gotten email from brewers who do what you're doing and uh, use alcohol to sanitize their mouths before sucking on the siphon hose, so you're not exactly plowing new ground there. However, um, I'd advise investing a small amount of money into an auto siphon. It took me a long time to break down and get one, but I I haven't regretted it since. Not, Not only do you have to not worry about infecting your beer with your mouth bugs, it's really handy. If you ever lose your siphon in the middle of transferring, if it stops, you just pump the auto siphon a time or two, and you're back in business. That's just my two cents. Get an auto siphon, skip the mouthwash, save the money that you would spend on mouthwash, and put it in an auto siphon. 
I appreciate all the email, everybody. If you would like to drop us a line, you can write to james at basicbrewing.com or just use the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. And don't forget to check your return address for your email. I got a couple of notes bounced back to me this week, so those people probably think I'm ignoring them. And I'm not. I tried to write back. didn't work. Now, I'm always keeping my eye out for interesting brewing or fermenting projects that are kind of off the beaten path. And apparently so is Don Osborne of St. Paul, Minnesota. Don wrote me a while back talking about his dandelion wine. I was intrigued. So I got him on the line to find out more. Well, Don Osborne, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thanks for having me, James. Now, let's before we get into uh, into talking about the dandelion wine, just give us some background on on your experience as a brewer in general. You you don't necessarily stick to just odd things, right? You <laughs> you do do that's, traditional beers. That's correct. I do like the odd things, though. Um, I've been brewing for about seven years, um, a little over seven years, and my experience, I think, is going to be similar to a lot of brewers out there, where you when you first brew a halfway decent batch of extract beer, you think, well, that's pretty cool. I wonder what else I can make. So after I did a few extract batches, I made a batch of root beer. Then I started making some mead. Later on, I made cider, then wine, and eventually I got into all-grain brewing. And um, I just like to experiment now and then. I like to take one gallon of a batch of beer and put it aside and throw some spices into it or fruit or something like that, and I was always been curious about dandelion wine, so I thought I would give it a try. Now, where did you first hear about dandelion wine? I think just it's just a wine of popular culture. I think we all maybe know a, a grandparent that tried it, or um, you heard about somebody's crazy uncle that made it, and maybe it <laughs> blew up a crock or you know you hear different stories and uh, grandma oh yeah grandma used to go pick dandelions and make wine and uh i thought hey i have a lot of dandelions <laughs> why don't i tap into this resource i just kind of just have always known about it we we uh in our contest of you know you're a home brewer when you know one guy said uh, you know you're a home brewer when you walk down the aisle of a grocery store and say hey i can ferment that and i can ferment I heard- that well, I heard that, and I nodded in agreement. <laughs> you went out to the yard, and you said, I can ferment that. And then yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> you, 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 other, other, uh, other people see their dandelions as a problem. You see it as an opportunity. Well, if I cared more about my lawn, I might think they were a problem. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't too much. <laughs> now, uh, you have put together a... a, a a well-crafted website uh, with nice pictures of all the process and all that. And if you would allow me to, I can link uh, to that page from the uh, Basic Brewing Radio site uh, so that people can can watch your progress. Would that be okay? That would be – yeah, that would be great. I'd be more than happy for anybody to take a look at it. That's that's why I put that stuff out there. Now, where did your recipe come from? Where did you get the uh, the details of how to do this? My recipe, I have to give credit where credit is due, and there's a guy named Jack Keller, and I really don't know anything about him other than his website, which is um, linked on my site. So, um, Or if a person searched for Jack Keller dandelion wine, you would probably find his page. But he had the most useful information that I could find on making a dandelion wine, and he has 30 recipes on dandelion wine alone and i read through all of those recipes and i also just used um some of my own experience in making the different things that i talked about before and so if there was a technique in one of the recipes that i thought well if i do that with a mead it's not going to turn out the way i like it i'm going to do something different so i just kind of used his recipes and my own experience and i came up with something that was um you know Fairly strictly based on some of his recipes, but just more of a combination of all of them. So he had 30 recipes on just dandelion wine? He does. They're not all his, but ah. he he uh, compiles them. And um, he has some of his own um, as well. And he says that those are the only ones he can vouch for 
And what and what, and my recipe is does adopt a couple of techniques and at least one of his recipes. So it is kind of a just something that I kind of made up with a, a little bit of reading and a little bit of just kind of gut feeling. Now, I before we go into the the technique, uh, I I can't I can't stand it any any longer. I we've we've poured some. I've poured yes. some in a in a crystal uh, wine glass, um, and I'm I'm going to swirl it around. It's the it's a um, it's a yellowish color as you would expect. What, how how would you descri- how would you describe the color? I would say that it is uh, yes, it's a, I'm kind of in a low light room, but kind of a a, a golden uh, straw, almost uh, if you're thinking of like a more of a golden pilsner or quell type of a color. Um, it's fairly clear right now. I think with time um, and proper decanting out of the bottle, it'll get even clearer. Uh, I should say it's about almost one year old right now. Um, so, and if you do a swirl, it does have a little bit of legs, kind of like a, you know, like a sweet meat, I guess. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Um, and it's um, it's it's very meaty, um, in my opinion, in the in the aroma. Yes, there's, uh, this is, I'm guessing, well, I know that it's at least 10% alcohol, and I'm guessing it could be as high as 12 or so. The reason I say I'm guessing is because after some of the fermentation was done, I added in some golden raisins, and I'm not quite sure how much sugar is in those and how much alcohol, you know, additional alcohol that contributed, but um, it, it, it's a wine. It's a 12%... Um, Alcohol, so you get a little bit of that aroma, but you also get quite a bit of sweetness. And I know you're having some nasal challenges, um, <laughs> but there is a light floral uh, character to it, and I can't really describe it as well as I would like. But I have to think that the dandelions themselves uh, do give it a little bit of of a floral character in the in the nose and in the taste. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm getting a little bit of the raisins, I think. But it would be interesting. It would have been more interesting if I hadn't seen the recipe before I, you know, experienced the aroma just to see what exactly I'm I'm smelling. But it is there is it is a floral, uh, um, almost a honey aroma uh, with a little hint of raisins. Uh, and I'm just I'm just going to taste a little bit. Yeah, go for it. I, I completely agree with the with the honey. Mm. Um, a description I I would describe this right now as kind of a young but sweet mead and mm-hmm. um, I mean just in general terms if you're thinking what is this going to taste like if I ever make it um, that's mm-hmm. kind of generally where I would I would put it. Oh, that's very nice. It's uh, sweet but not uh, cloying, and you don't really get the alcohol. There is an alcohol bite at the end, um, mm-hmm. but it's not harsh. Um, it's not too harsh, but I believe that something like this with this kind of alcohol, I believe that it will get better uh, with more time. And like I said, it's almost a year old. In about a week, it'll be a year since I made it. But I, I think that in six months to a year to a, even another couple of years, I think it will maybe even get better. Hmm. Now, just out of curiosity, did you taste any of the dandelion flowers before the process just to see if you could get... Any kind of a flavor from raw dandelion flower? No, uh, no, James. I was not <laughs> compelled to to eat the eat those dandelion heads. I <laughs> I suppose that would have been instructional, but I tell you what, I got I had a plastic bag filled <laughs> with nothing but dandelion heads cut off of their greenery, and that that was a pretty that was quite a potent smell right there. Yeah, I, you don't think of dandelions having a smell, or at least I don't. And now, I, of course, I'll pay more attention. But uh, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't think of a recognizable smell from from dandelions. Um, so let's let's start talking about the process. And you, you really have to show your dedication to the the hobby, uh, <laughs> at least in the initial phase here. Uh, Tell us about how how many dandelions you collected and how you collected them. Okay, recipes call for quite a range of. They kind of term it by. Usually, you'll see number of court number of courts of uh, picked flower heads, 
So what you do is you grab the flower and you, you want to have some kind of a c- uh, scissors and you grab the flower head and you kind of pinch it up with your fingers and you cut it and you want to get as little of the greenery um, as you can. And I'm not talking about the stem or any of that. I'm just talking about even on the flower head itself. Everything I've read is most people suggest just getting just as much yellow as you can. So even so, the little the little green petal looking things around the flower head, you don't want those. Yeah, you you will fill up your quart jar faster if you include you know some of that. But um, I have a picture on my page, and in the picture I actually am taking more of that green that you just mentioned than I than I came to be taking later on after I cut you know cut a little bit more. Um, I came up with for what I wanted to do um, about I used about 2.5 quarts for one gallon um, of uh, of the wine and I and I know that you were you you remarked to me that you didn't know if you could sit there and pick uh, <laughs> what did I figure out I think 400 yeah. 400 flowers for one court i think is is, is how, how many i just counted once just because i was curious how, how many it would actually take and i picked that was 400 quarts and i was wanting 2.5 quarts per gallon i was actually doing two gallons so it was about it was about 2,000 flowers i think i picked wow now but i think the point is uh <laughs> One of my friends who has made this wine uh, in the past, he kind of romanticizes it by saying that when you drink the wine a couple years down the road in the middle of winter and you open the bottle and you get this whiff of maybe this uh, floral essence off the glass and you are reminded about that spring day Uh. that you were out in the grass picking flowers, the sun is shining, um, maybe it's, you know, where I live, maybe it's 10 below in the winter and, and you, and you're taken back to that time. So even though it's, you know, you gotta, I don't know, you gotta sweat a little bit to, to get something like that in the bottle. But, um, you know, it's, it's just kind of part of the whole process. It's, it's springtime in the glass. I guess you could describe it that way. <laughs> so, sure. so do you have chiggers in in Minnesota? No, no, thank goodness we don't, because I know what those things are, and we don't have those. Chigger, you have ticks though, don't you? We or, do have ticks, but not just you know in a grassy park field. Okay. <laughs> so, so how do you pass the time when you're when you're picking uh, or you're cutting meticulously two thousand? dandelion heads I think i mean a person i don't think i did this but a person could have a some music going i suppose you could have your dandelion wine playlist all queued up <laughs> or some um, some nice brewing podcasts you could have some nice brewing podcasts i think i just i don't know james i think <laughs> i just sang some songs to myself i don't know looked at the people looking at me wondering what is this bozo doing out here be hired by the park board. <laughs> so obviously, you want to pick a place that hasn't been treated with any sort of herbicide, right? That's correct. You you want yes. organic, uh, non poisoned dandelion uh, heads. Yes, that is that is definitely correct. And depending on how many you have in your yard, you might just be able to get them from there. Well, uh, you know, well, well, we probably have that many. But uh, they're, they've already gone to a seed, so... Uh, wow. <clears throat> yeah. I haven't even seen one yet. Well, uh, uh, so, you, so you get 2,000 uh, dandelion heads. Then what? What do you do with them then? I'll just do a quick clarification. You get 2,000. If I was doing... I wanted to do two gallons because I didn't want to do all this work for one gallon. But you would pick a couple quart jars. You could pill, you know fill a couple of quart jars if you just wanted to make a gallon. You take the dandelion heads home, um, and this is where recipes vary greatly, even starting now, um, what you will do. The way I decided to do it was to heat just enough water to cover the dandelions, um, and then I brought it to a boil, and I let it boil for about 10 minutes. And at that point, I had also thrown in um, my zest of my oranges and my lemons, which I decided to go that route instead of later on adding acid blend, hmm. which I don't I don't make a lot of wine, but I know that that's something that some of the recipes called for. It was either you could use lemons or oranges or a combination, 
or you could add some acid blend. So you use I, you use the zest from one lemon and two oranges. Um, according to yes. this recipe, yes. Yes, for one gallon, that's what you would do. And so I added that into the boil. All that boiled for about ten minutes. Um, I turned the heat off, and I just I think I just put the cover on it and let it sit for. And again, now this is where everything varies greatly. Some people let it sit for two or three days, stirring maybe once or twice a day. Other people let it sit for 10 days. Wow. And I thought, I thought the way I came to view it is the dandelions are like your steeping grains if you're brewing extract beer. They are not providing any fermentable sugar. That was kind of something I came to had to learn because I was wondering about lilac wine, dandelion wine. What you know, where is the where do you get the fermentables from? It's not from the flower. So I decided I didn't want to let it sit on this stuff for ten days. And there was a couple recipes that said you could let it sit just for a matter of hours. And I thought, okay, for my first time, I'm gonna do it that way. So I let it sit for a couple hours. And then at the end of the day, that's when I um, added my sugar, my calculated amount of sugar that I decided to use, uh, stirred it all up so the sugar was dissolved, and then I added my yeast, kind of looking at my notes. I also added some yeast nutrient, um, and that's about it. I got up to two gallons after um, I added all the ingredients that I included in my recipe. So five pounds of sugar... Uh, so so basically, uh, the sugar comes from table sugar. I mean, that's the that's the fermentable. That is the uh, dirty secret about your country wines, about your uh, your lilac wine or your dandelion wine, is that almost all these recipes just called for yeah white granulated sugar. And I think I had a maybe a four pound bag, and I must have dumped it all out to see how many cups it was. And this isn't extremely scientific but for me it looked like it was about two cups for one pound Hmm. so then i could just use that to figure out if i knew how many pounds i wanted i just had to use two cups for each pound of sugar that i wanted and it just kind of worked out that way so um so you had you obviously you needed you you want a yeast nutrient uh, for all that much just hard sugar but uh, what what was the yeast that you chose? I went with um, 71B Nar- Narbonne yeast. I don't know if that's, what is it, how do you say that, La- Lavin? Mm-hmm. Lavlin? 71B. Um, that's a yeast that I've used for meads before, and it's done a pretty good sh- job chewing through 8, 10, 12, I think even, geez, 15% of alcohol for a, for a, a mead, which is just honey. So I thought if that yeast can consume and um, ferment all of that type of a sugar, I thought maybe it could do the the table sugar as well. Um, I suppose, you know, in retrospect, there's a few things I maybe would do differently if I make this again. Um, I might have put two packets of yeast in just right away. Just, you know, maybe it would be seen as overkill, but um, it didn't, it, I kind of had trouble getting it to ferment to as low as I had hoped. Um, I am happy with how it came out, but I thought that it would ferment lower. It really didn't ever get below about like 1037 or so, hmm. which seems seems awfully high for a final gravity, but the starting gravity was 1108, and according to my calculations, that makes it almost 10% alcohol just right there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like I said, I added... Raisins, which was which was at the ratio of one pound of raisins per one gallon. So if you were thinking about that for a typical batch of beer, that would be a lot of fruit that you would be adding. Mm-hmm. So that is going to add um, definitely some sugar and increase the alcohol content. So um, did, so did you add the raisins before fermentation? I decided not to because just for the sake of I figured the sugar would be because I wasn't boiling the sugar I just added it to the by the time I said I let the dandelion steep about five hours I uh, I uh, uh, had a straining bag and I poured the liquid 
through the straining bag and collected all the dandelions. So then I just had my lukewarm water, and that was able to dissolve the sugar, which I figured was pretty pure. I wasn't worried about any contaminants. But by the time I was thinking about adding the raisins, I thought, well, I don't know if there's some, you know, errant bacteria or something in the raisin. So I waited a little while so that there would be some alcohol in the in the wine already. Mm-hmm. And then I added the raisins after five days or a week or, or something like that. So how was the how was the fermentation? Was it uh, was it very active? It was pretty active. Um, I don't know if I took many notes on that or not. Um, I can't remember. I mean, I don't think it was like a beer. If I, I keep kind of equating it to to mead, um, even though maybe it's more comparable to wine. Um, but anytime you're dealing with that much sugar and a gravity of 1108, it's just gonna it's is gonna take a while for that to ferment out. Um, I didn't take any notes on the on the on the fermentation. I do have um, where's my gravity reading here? Well, after about let's see, after here we go. After three weeks, it went from 1108 down to 1045. So that was in that was in three weeks, and that was after I added the raisins, which would have boosted up the theoretical starting gravity to some you know something higher than 1108 mm-hmm. and and actually my final gravity i have written down here as 1039 so you know after 1045 it didn't really get that much lower and i waited another six or eight months to bottle it hmm. so um i guess maybe that's the answer to your question in about three weeks the majority of the fermentation was done and so you uh you wanted it to be a lower gravity than that. So what what kind of um, strategies did you use to try to bring that down some more? I did a couple things. I read about uh, racking the wine. That's one thing. If you read some of these recipes for this type of a wine, you will read about um, if just keep racking it and racking it until it gets clearer and clearer. And they also talk about how that makes it ferment lower. And I think what they get at is that it's stirring up the yeast that may be left in the, even though the idea is to rack it off the yeast, I think you're kind of stirring some of it up when you rack it, and so fermentation begins again. Hmm. So what I did when I wasn't getting my the gravity down to where I wanted is I um, would gently tip it, you know, on its side, and I could see a layer of sediment on the bottom, and I would try to, I well, I would get that suspended back up into the wine, and it would become cloudy, and then it would bubble a few times um, over the next however many days, and then I would do it again when all of the stuff settled on the bottom. So that was one thing I did. Another thing I did, which I don't think did anything, is I did try adding a little Beano. But I think that the sugar that maybe is in uh, a, a beer that doesn't ferment down quite as low as you want, this is this is where I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. But... <laughs> I'm speculating that the Beano maybe because I've used Beano in a you know a high a high final gravity Doppelbach that just didn't get down to where I wanted it and it gets it down a few more points and it and it works well and I don't think the Beano did anything in the in the wine. Yeah, the Beano is an enzyme, right? And yep, that and would it, that it, would break down. It seems like to me that and this is an area that I'm fogging on as well. It seems like that Beano would break more complex sugars down into simple sugars but if you've just got simple sugars uh in the form of your table sugar already i don't know it doesn't seem like it would do that much that that could be it and i can just hear people yelling at the radio right now (laughs) that that could be exactly what happened so the beano didn't work but here is what i found i am i'm happy it was a happy accident if this thing would have gone down to where many of the recipes say that it will, which is very close to 1.000, which is mm. where a, a wine will get to, or a wine will go below that, I, I mean a kit wine, um, I th- this thing would have been 14.5% alcohol plus the raisins. Mm. So probably 16.5%, 17% alcohol, and it would have been 
well, I would have had to add honey back into it or something to kind of give it some body and some more sweetness. It would have been terrible like that. So as it is, it actually came out just about how I would have wanted it, even though I didn't know it at the time that I was making it. Yeah, it seems like to me that if it were any drier than this, I mean, it, it might be able to dry up a little bit, but to me, part of the charm of this is the sweetness. I mean, it's, I, it's I, like it's like some of the meads from Redstone, you know, the the kind of not the heaviest ones that they make, but you know, the kind of mid range ones that they make that are that are nice and sweet, like their vanilla and um, <clears throat> vanilla and cinnamon mead, which kind of reminds me. Uh, there are elements of this that remind me of that. Um, I think this is just fine. I, you know, I it, it's not I, cloyingly sweet. I agree in that I the meads that I've made are all purposefully sweet meads. Uh, that's just how I like them. Um, a dandelion wine could be for somebody who wants to make a dry, white, light, floral wine because many of the recipes talk about that is exactly what you will get if you follow these instructions, that you will get, um, you know, just a dry wine, and, and, and people like it that way. But um, like I said, I like to make sweet meads, and that this came out a little bit sweeter than I originally planned, um, I'm actually happy about. You know, one, one thought came to mind when you were talking about people racking uh, the wine back and forth between uh, carboys or between vessels. Um, you're also aerating uh, the wine at that time as well. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know that, that if that would, uh, as well as rousing the yeast, you're also uh, introducing oxygen, which could have detrimental effects on the on the taste of the wine over time, or uh, it could have positive effects theoretically on uh, giving the, the yeast more oxygen to, to continue working. I don't know. I was trying... Not to do that, but I believe that you're right. Anytime you transfer, you're doing that maybe on a, you know, hopefully a small level. But uh, that was that was not part of the goal um, of when I would rack it. I mean, it was mostly just to kind of keep getting it more and more clear. Right. But my my kind of my swirling it gently in the in the little one gallon carboys that I used that was to just try to get these back into suspension. I, I don't I don't know what a person would do to be honest to get it much lower than it was other than use more yeast. I did actually pitch a second packet of yeast at some point, um, and that's why I'm wondering if a person was to do two packets right away, um, mm-hmm. if it would have fermented lower. But uh, I don't know what else you you could do other than maybe just use less sugar to begin with, mm. and you still would end up with a, you know, I went from. 1108 to about 1039, you could probably go from, well, I don't know, you know, 1080 to, you know what I mean? You could go from 1080 to 1010, mm-hmm. and it would be the same amount of alcohol, but you would end up with less body and less sweetness. Right. Now, I'm I'm really pleased. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised that, um, I mean, just reading the recipe, when I saw five pounds of sugar, I thought, yep. wow, this is going to be, you know... <clears throat> rocket fuel. Yep, <laughs> yep. C- cidery and just almost undrinkable. I mean, that's it was kind of a. It, I mean, it was it was an experiment to try. It was one of those things where I thought, well, I can I can read all these recipes and understand how they get um, what they get out of the ingredients, but I just wanted to come up with my own way of doing it. Another thing I guess I'll mention is uh, the dandelions themselves, they're contributing, they are, like you said it earlier on, they are contributing some color and uh, a little bit of flavor and a little bit of aroma. And what I, one thing I might do, I think I'm, I might try this again this spring just for, um, to see how it would be different, but I think I might actually leave it for a longer steep. Hmm. I might leave it for at least a couple days. I did, there are literally recipes that say leave it there for 10 days. And even though you haven't added any sugar yet, I just I just didn't want to leave it that long. I didn't know what would happen to it. Yeah, you don't. Or what you, it would smell like or taste like or anything at that point. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an, interesting, an interesting thought. And, uh, but, and it might be worth splitting a batch uh, in the future, you know, maybe doing a thousand... Heads, you know. <laughs> there you go again. For... What's your, your counting? 
You really want to, you know what, I, I'm going to predict you're going to make this, and you're going to get out there, and you're going to count them, and you're going to love it. <laughs> no, you've told me how many, uh, you know, properly cropped uh, dandelion right. heads fit in a quart, so I don't have to count. No, you have done, have you've done a service for us, Don. I've, I've taken one for the team, James. You have, you have. Um, so, but so, yeah, I would, I would probably let it, I think I'll, next time I'll let it steep for, say, two days. The point I'm trying to make is there could be contributions from the flower heads that maybe I'm not even getting by hmm. doing only a, a five hour steep. Yeah. You know, maybe there's more flavor and more aroma and more color that I could have extracted that I that I didn't get. Now can you use this same strategy for making wines out of other flowers or other things that we wouldn't think of making a wine out of? From my understanding, I, I I looked around a little bit and a couple, like I said, a couple of the things that kind of made me curious after I was successfully making beer, mead, cider was, well, what is this lilac wine? Uh, being a Jeff Buckley fan, he does a song and I, and of course dandelion wine and I started searching around and I think you're right. You basically need sugar, you need yeast, and you need some type of acid to kind of balance it out. Um, but other than that, there's recipes for lilac wine, dandelion wine, um, and I suppose there's, I, I can only imagine the amount of sort of, I think they're sort of called country wines, this type mm. of thing. Mm. Um, also, people do make wine, say, from strawberries or cherries or other fruits that do have sugar in them. So then it becomes a little bit different because you're not just dumping in as much um, or maybe any uh, white sugar, but um, as far as flowers and things like that, I'm sure there's any number of recipes out there for this type of wine. I mean, any any flower that you could eat. Like, can't you eat roses, or or can you? I don't know. Don't eat roses. I, <laughs> That's my legal you've disclaimer. You've already asked me about tasting dandelions. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like to eat flowers, James? Well, I have in the All past. Right. You know, we've gone to fancy restaurants, and they've put the... Uh, Oh, what do they put on it? Hey, you've had flowers on it as a garnish on a plate, haven't you? Like I, uh, pansies, or are they have pansies, or what do they have on the plate? And, do they do that at uh, TGI Fridays? I don't know. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't know. Chilies. I I you, think could, they, you could do a rose. You could do a rose wine. I would think. I mean, that would be but, something special for like a if you had somebody uh, you know who was uh, used to. Is suspected was getting engaged. Of course, you know, uh, you'd want to do this out way ahead of time. But, uh, you know, that might be an interesting thing to toast with, uh, you know, something made out of uh, some beautiful flowers or something like that. Uh, you know, can you imagine a like a pink wine made with uh, some some red rose petals or something like that? Who I knows? can imagine it. I can imagine it. Uh, Jack Keller... There, he has a, a number of different recipes. I don't know how many different flower type recipes he has, but I know that um, I know that if you find his page, uh, a person will get all kinds of ideas for different backyard things you can you can produce. <laughs> I bet in a, I in a good way. That. I'm not talking about bombs. I'm you know, <laughs> talking about fermentation. <laughs> I I'll bet I can ferment that. I can. <laughs> That's right. Yep. You know you're a home brewer when you go to your backyard and you look around and yeah, I you can d- make a wine out of that. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm always bad when I walk through the sporting goods section at Walmart, but you know because it's like, oh, that'd make a mash tun. That yep. <laughs> that Who doesn't cooler. do that? <laughs> Who doesn't even walk through a grocery store and see for some reason if they have stock pots and you think. Maybe I should grab another one, another four-gallon <laughs> pot. Yeah, you you can't have too many pots. No. no. <laughs> well, uh, any any other any other thoughts? Um, you know, on what would you do? Uh, anything that that we haven't mentioned that you would do differently next time? Yeah, there are a few things that a person could do different. Um, I, I would probably do a couple things different. I did mention I may use. Um, a longer steeping time on the initial day after I've picked the flowers. Another variable would be the amount of flowers per gallon that a person could use. Um, I was pretty happy with my 
Uh, the amount I decided to go with, I kind of picked a middle of the road. It was more than a lot of recipes, but not as much as some. Um, but maybe the next time what I would do is use the same amount of flowers, but a longer steeping time and just kind of play with one variable at a time. Um, maybe a different yeast would be a better fermenter than the, than the, than the Narbonne, although the Narbonne does normally do well for me with meads. Um, you had mentioned, um, you just kind of mentioning some of the spices that, uh, is it redstone mm-hmm. meadery mm-hmm. that they put in their meats? There wouldn't be any reason a person couldn't put a little bit of cinnamon maybe in a in a wine like this since it's kind of mead like with this amount of sweetness in it anyway. Um you know, you could you could play with that if you wanted to. Um and maybe the only other variable I can think of right away um is maybe use less sugar to begin with, which would mean Maybe about the same amount of alcohol in the end, but it might mean a little bit less body and less sweetness and more of a dry wine, which is not my favorite type of of mead or wine, but um, it would just be another, it would be something else that um, could be a variable that somebody could play with. So so one more question. Does this, you know, you you always uh, hear of... uh, you know, like early homebrew where they used a lot of table sugar and in, in fermenting and the, you know, the ear splitting headaches the next day. Uh, right. Have you experienced that or have you overindulged in the dandelion wine or, or are you very, uh, or do you treat it as precious uh, so far? I'm one, I'm the kind of a person that is, for some reason, I have the ability to really lay off of stuff that, that I believe will get better with time. I've got, Barley wines from 2004, meads from 05. Um, I just like to store stuff for a long time if I feel like it gets better. And so with that said, this mead is not even, or this wine is not even quite one year old. And there I was going to mention, many of the recipes say don't even taste the wine until one year has passed. Hmm. So we're drinking it right about that time where it's supposed to first be considered drinkable but not considered um, totally ready so um, although I have heard of what you mentioned um, people drinking too much dandelion wine and not really remembering what how they got to the backyard that they ended up in but <laughs> but uh, I have not experienced that yet I mean you could probably chase the green fairy or I guess in this case maybe the yellow fairy but um, I haven't, haven't gone gone there yet I did bottle um, at least three full-sized wine bottles wow. of the wine, just just kind of for fun, and then a lot of six-ounce bottles and a few 12-ounce bottles. But maybe, James, I'll get crazy one day and bust out a whole 25 ounces of this and see where the yellow fairy takes me. <laughs> well, on that and- note, <laughs> Don, I appreciate your time, and thank you very much for uh, for sending me this. This is This is wonderful. Well, it's been really fun, and thanks for having me. Well, thanks again to Don. I'll post a link to Don's page on the Dandelion Winemaking Experience in the description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check your address. And uh, check out our low-tech lagering decoction mashing DVD on basicbrewing.com where you can see Steve Wilkes do a single-step decoction mash and follow me through a lager fermentation in the middle of summer where I don't use a a dedicated chest freezer. There are also our original DVDs and Basic Brewing Introduction to Extract Home Brewing. We walk you through the extract brewing process step-by-step from boiling to bottling. And in Basic Brewing, stepping into all grain, we take you through the all grain process from milling your grain to collecting your wort. We show you uh, infusion mashing and step mashing and uh, batch sparging and fly sparging. We got combo deals on our site to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order it online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. We've also got hats and shirts, including our Go Forth and Flocculate shirt. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link, as I mentioned in the top of the show. 
We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Smart French Audio CDs, Beginner Level, and Logitech Cordless Desktop EX110. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. Don't forget the Amazon Kindle link if you're going to buy one of those. Well, that's all until next week. Till then, thanks for listening. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson down in Austin. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.